A very good day to Mr. Kwan Man Leong, Managing Director of Harta Lega Holdings Berhad. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for today's Power Talk session. My name is Rowena and I'll be your MC for today. Thank you for joining us today for Power Talks presented to you by Starbees and Star TV. Ladies and gentlemen, Power Talks was created for readers of the Star to get up close and personal with high profile business leaders and captains of industries and is our way of connecting with our readers. Today, we are honoured to have with us Mr. Kwan Man Leong, Managing Director of Harta Lega Holdings Berhad. We are sure that after this talk, you will be empowered by his compelling views and insights. At the end of this session, there will be a Q&A session with our guest speaker. <coughs> to tell us more about Mr. Kwan Man Leong, let us invite our moderator for today, Mr. Shamugam, Specialist Editor of Starbeats on stage. A very good morning to everybody and welcome to Manara Star. And um, this is the last session of the Power Talk business series for the year. You know, we have been holding this talk for two years now. Okay, we have had a good set of uh, speakers for, uh, from the corporate sector, captains of the industry uh, from various sectors and who have shared with us the experiences on the ups and downs and, and how they overcame or managed to overcome the, the adversaries, the, the problems in their respective areas of expertise. Um, and um, the glove industry is no different. Uh, based on my experience, it's a very tough industry because the competition is not within domestic. It's a global stage out there. There are no barriers to entry. And um, uniquely, Malaysia has got some of the world's top class glove manufacturers. And they compete among themselves. And among themselves, we are fortunate to have Harta Lega here. I think, and easily the, the, the top among the glove manufacturers today. I still remember in the 1990s, the industry was still in the infancy stage as far as the capital markets were concerned. There were very few listed glove uh, players then. And fund managers, uh, I'm mean, talking about the established names, would not want to take a stake in these glove companies because you know, they do not know the cost structure, they do not know where is the next competition going to come from, and they don't know who is going to be the next leader. Because the industry is so tough. Okay, amidst all this, you know, in the 19, uh, I think 1980s, Hartalega was formed. Uh, it was started by Mr. Kwan Kamhun. I'm, I'm told to call him as KH. KH. Okay, a very simple man. Um, he is not an engineer by training, but he, I'm told that he has this uncanny ability to, uh, to, to know or to understand how machines work and how to improvise on machines. And it was this thing that actually has uh, brought about the cutting edge for Harta Lega. You know, the, the glove industry, it's, it's, um, what's very important for glove industries is the product itself has got to be thin, light, and as good as your skin, because the users, the end users at the end of the day, the various uh, industry, uh, hospitals and places like that, you know, it must be compatible. So this is where Hartaliga had a cutting edge. Uh, I'm told uh, after the first factory was set up in 1981, uh, some seven years later, it um, managed to produce this ultra, let me see, okay, what is it? It's called... Um, uh, the lightweight nitrile glove, the ultra lightweight nitrile glove. Okay, and uh, I think we'll hear more about that later on. Mm, and um, that actually gave Harta Lega a cutting edge, and KH was instrumental in that. And um, later on, in the year 2012, uh, KH became the executive chairman, and 
His son, Kwan Man Leong, whom you're going to hear speak today, took over the helm. And Man Leong has brought Hartal Liga to greater heights. The company's sales revenue and all has increased by double or three times. And today, Harta Lega is the world's most expensive listed glove manufacturer. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really wouldn't want to waste more time here talking. You know, I think we all came here to hear what Man Leong has got to say. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Kwan Man Leong to the stage. Thanks, uh, Sham. Uh, I'm, I'm really flattered by your comment. You know, a, it's not my sole effort, uh, you know, to have uh, increased the size of the company by, you know, two folds or three folds. Uh, I have a lineup of uh, people here in front of me. Uh, they too have worked very hard. You know, I, I have my cousins, my my brother who's in a business, uh, and uh, I, I I do not know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate because we have to put a face in front of, you know to front the company and I'm chosen to be the front of the company but uh, behind the scenes they, they have all worked very hard you know, um, and that's where the, uh, the value of the Kwan family, the family who operates the business. So before I start, just uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for taking time um, on the weekend to come to the Star Power Talk. Um, it's on Hatalega's uh, growth and uh, transformation. Uh, before I go into the, uh, you know, the formality, the, the formal talk, right? I just want to find out. Uh, can I have a show of hands? Uh, who have, who is invested in Hatalega, or, or who were invested in Hatalega? Can I have a show of hands? Quite a number. Right? Okay. So if you have not invested, you know, consider us. <laughs> um, can I have a show of hands on uh, who are the students uh, in this room? Who are students? Good. Um, come and work for us when you graduate. <laughs> so I've got my cousin here. Uh, he's a HR director. He'll be coming around to take your names. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I've noticed uh, familiar faces. Uh, my friends, they're here as well. Don't, please don't put up your hands because I know that some of you came because you thought that there will be dog gifts, right? Um, I think what you need to do is buy our shares, then you get to attend the AGM, and we do give up dog gifts uh, during our AGM. Uh, now, jokes aside, um, I just want to start off um, by saying that normally when I go out to meet people, uh, someone would normally come and ask me, what do I do for a living? And I would normally tell them, oh, I work for a glove company. And they say, oh, glove company, Malaysia is the world's largest, isn't it? What's your company's name? I say, Hatalega. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, what's, what's the name again? I say, Hatalega. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I heard about this company before, yeah. You know. And the conversation would normally go quiet after that. <laughs> And I think the, uh, among the investment community, the corporate scene, Hatalega is very well known, uh, being the world's uh, most valuable glove company uh, by market capitalization. But in as far as the general public is concerned, I think uh, Hatalega is a lesser known uh, glove company for several reasons. Now, perhaps the first reason is because the Kwan family who runs the business uh, including myself, is very publicity shy. So it's, it's ironic, right, uh, that I'm here today. So please don't ask me why I'm here today. Uh, up until now, I still wonder how I got, how Tony managed to charm me into doing this. You know. Uh, you know, Tony, thanks for getting me in trouble. If you don't believe me, you know, I'm wearing a Fitbit, right? You check my heart rate. It's 150 beats per minute now. <laughs> I, I'm, actually, I'm really, really nervous. Uh, you know, it's, it's just that I, I'm good in hiding my emotions uh, behind the face. Um, so yeah, the Kwan family is, is it's a very publicity shy uh, family. Um, you know, we, we, we just go on and, and, and do our work. Um, 
And perhaps the second reason is because of the name Hatalega itself, which is very difficult for people to relate Hatalega to glove uh, manufacturing. Uh, in fact, if you look closely, Hata means uh, property. Lega means prosperity in Basel, Malaysia. If you put the two together, what Hatalega was supposed to mean is prosperous property. So that was exactly the initial intended purpose when Hatalega was formed, which was for property development. Right? And it was an extension to the family business in the 80s, in the early 80s, which my grandfather used to uh, operate. Uh, it was a building construction uh, business uh, under the name Kuan Yin and Sons. So Kuan Yin and Sons used to uh, build quality homes um, and many VVIPs used to queue up and wait for their houses to be built by my grandfather simply because of the reason that my grandfather, together with my uh, father and uh, my uncles, were able to deliver very high quality homes, uh, highly reputable. And that's why they queue up for their homes to be built by my grandfather. So my grandfather uh, prescribed strongly to values like quality and integrity. And these values have permeated or carried through to my father's generation. And uh, if my father permits me to claim as such, to my generation as well. Right? And it is these values that have carried us through to all the businesses that we have done uh, within the Kwan family. So what happened to Hatalega as a property development? It did not take off because some things that needed to be done for the business to go on uh, were against the principles of my, my grandfather. My grandfather is a very principle-orientated uh, man. So he objected to the business and this allowed the business to take off and therefore the name Hatalega and the company was shelved. Right. And it was up until year 1988 where my father uh, you know, uh, decided to start a manufacturing outfit, glove manufacturing outfit, and he conveniently took the name Hatalega, and, and there you go, as uh, they all say, the rest is history. So, um, the other thing that I, I like to express before I go on to the, the boring stuff, right? Uh, they, uh, actually, I feel very humbled uh, for being given the opportunity to speak here, and especially so because I'm a second generation uh, managing director. Um, there are a lot more other uh, bigger figures out there, I think, who deserves to be standing on this stage uh, here today. Um, I think certainly one of the, the, those uh, uh, people is my father, Mr. Kwan Kam Hon. Uh, Mr. Kwan is the founder of Hatta Lega. Um, he's the reason why Hatta, for, for what Hatta Lega is today. Um, my father is a, a, a great innovator by talent and a master entrepreneur uh, with a lot of passion. So can we put our hands together for my father, Mr. Kwan? <laughs> so, uh, and I'm also very thankful that he has entrusted me to speak today on, on behalf of Hatalega. Right, so the purpose why I, uh, the reason why I've agreed to come here to speak, of course, besides the a, you know, charismatic quality of Tony. Tony is our PR agency, who so manages our PR. Um, I felt compelled to provide or give back to the communities or people who have affiliation with Hatalega, in a sense that to provide insights to you on how organizations grow and what kind of transformation that organizations need to undertake in order to ensure that the success, the growth, is successful. Right? And I think that Hatalega is a good platform uh, for us to, to use uh, for knowledge sharing. Uh, because we grew 21 times in the short span of 13 years. And if you look at us, in the last two years, we doubled the size of the company from 1 billion revenue to above 2 billion. You know, it's unprecedented. It's never been heard before in the glove industry. And at the same time, we not only grew in size, we grew in capabilities, we are better. Our quality is better now. Our, our performance, uh, our people's capabilities, management is a lot better now. So I just want to share with you. But 
the most important thing is I will also share with you the mistakes that we made. You know, uh, I think that's very important. Right? And the learning points, the learning lessons from the mistakes that we made. So I've decided that is a no, we'll not hold back. We'll give you all the inside story about Hatsalega. So before I move on, for the benefit of the, the attendees, uh, I just, very quickly, I just give you an introduction about Hatsalega. Um, we're the world's largest nitrile glove manufacturer, 29 billion pieces of gloves that we produce. Right. Um, we have the world's fastest uh, production lines, uh, churning production uh, output of 45,000 pieces per hour, unmatched in the world. Uh, Forbes Asia, we won this award uh, for being Asia's best under a billion uh, company for four consecutive years. Uh, none of the other glove companies have uh, ever done this, achieved this. And I think we have run a very few Malaysian company who has won this for four, years, four consecutive years. So we are globally uh, recognized as a high performance company. Our profit margins have been consistently double the uh, industry's average. It take over the span of uh, maybe 12 you know, 10 to 12 years, we have consistently delivered above industries average. I still remember when we went for IPO, uh, I have one person here, uh, Sui San. Sorry to put you on the spot. Sui San is an astute uh, investor. They, she came to look at us in our, one of our investors' uh, presentation. Uh, that to Sui San is over there. Yeah. <laughs> so we presented our numbers. We said, well, we, we are more than double the industry's margin. And Sui San was like, what made you so good? Who are you? You know, Susan was a skeptic and uh, we brought her to see the plan. And from that day onwards, she's a strong follower, a strong believer of Hatalega. Because she understood how we did things differently. And all the technology that we have today is all in-house invented, in-house engineered with a strong team of engineers. This is a DNA of Hatzelega that up until now no other glove company can emulate. So this has been our growth, uh, you know, in market cap. Now we are the world's most valuable glove company. Share price has increased by 3,400%, uh, about 35 times since listing. Uh, being an innovative company, we have many industries first, or rather these are world's first. You know, we have a lineup of uh, world's first uh, products that we have launched into the market. And all these are technology, world's first glove production technology that were all invented within Hatalegas, within the four walls of Hatalega. Mm -hmm. And one of the products that was a game changer, it was a disruptive innovation, was our lightweight nitrile glove. Right? This has changed the global landscape of the rubber glove market. Today, nitrile glove share of the global market, we estimate is about 60%. But before Hatalega came up with our lightweight nitrile glove, it was just less than 5%. So we disrupted the uh, global market. Right. And this has been our growth in revenue, uh, 21 times over 13 years, average growth of 28%. So now, in this era of growth, high growth, we started in year 2005, right up until year 2018. This is a projection, right? Now, I, which brings me to, uh, to the next slide. I've put everything in a timeline. Now, I will begin to relate to you the story of Hatalega's growth and transformation. Our first uh, big break uh, started in year 2005 when we launched our world's first lightweight nitrile glove. And together, with uh, the technology that we have, which is the world's first double former production line able to produce 28,000 pieces per hour uh, of gloves. And these lines are much higher in, in speed. At that time, the average line speed in the industry was only 10,000 pieces per hour. But this is an end result, you know, the, the lightweight nitrile glove and the production line. Our work started much earlier, in year 2002, where we went into intense research and development, you know, to develop a glove that an, a glove that the market will like. And what do I mean by the market will like is that at that time the glove market was
protected by natural rubber glove. But the problem with natural rubber glove is uh, the prices of raw material is very volatile because it's subjected to climatic changes. There's peak season, low crop, uh, low seasons, low yield seasons. Uh, it was subjected to speculation on uh, commodities trading market. So, and glove prices are quoted to our buyers on a monthly basis. But our buyers actually sell this product into the market on a committed contractual price of three years, can it be up to three years. So all these price fluctuations were not liked by our buyers and certainly not preferred by us as manufacturers or people who run the business, right? We do not like volatility. So my father, you know, wanted to find a product that gives price stability. And we saw opportunity in nitrile material because at that time, the demand of that, this material is very low and therefore the prices is like straight line, a flat line. But the problem is, at that time, nitrile glove technology was not advanced. Nitrile gloves then was very thick, very heavy. You know, it doesn't give the tactile sensitivity for medical practitioners. So it was not used in hospitals where this is a large consumption, yeah? where there's large consumption. Um, and it is only used in automotive industry or in industrial markets. Very small amount, less than 5%, maybe 2 to 3% of the global market. So these are barriers that we needed to overcome. And we went into R&D to overcome these barriers. And at the same time, you know, being uh, progressive in our thinking, right? We knew we needed a refreshed technology to be able to produce nitrile glove cost effectively. So we also went into R&D on production technology. I still remember we, we, we built a room. It's a prototype room. And then we, we erected a prototype line. And very often, my father, myself, and an engineer will be you know, working to late hours, wee hours in, in, in the day in that room to test the prototype lines. And after we finish the day testing, we come out from the room and we shut all the windows. They were all frosted, right? And then we locked the doors to make sure that our secrets are, you know, kept, you know, in that prototype room. So that went on for like uh, one and a half to two years. Then we found that, you know, we are successful. You know, our big break came and we built, we built the plan. Uh, we went to a full scale model. We constructed the first line. That was plant tree. And then we launched the lightweight nitrile glove of a 4.7 gram in weight. Right? As compared to the conventional nitrile glove, then was 7 gram in weight. So it was a lot, it was a lot lighter. Um, but at the same time, actually, in fact, we also developed a 3.7 gram at the same time. But we kept it in a wall chest. We kept it in a wall chest because we knew that competitors will retaliate. And true enough, you know, just fast forward five years later, 2000 and, uh, sorry, not five years later, uh, two years later, 2007, our competitor launched a 4.1 gram nitrile glove, lighter than our 4.7 gram, and then we straight away, we put out the 3.7 gram, caught them by surprise again. So from then on, we, 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 our R&D effort uh, is our DNA, we never stopped. We continue to develop new products, we continue to upgrade our production technology. So we completed plant tree in year 2007. So sales was very good. Uh, sales grew exponentially. And at year 2007, I still remember it was a crossroad for the Kwan family. It's a crossroad because after we completed plant tree, we had to decide what to do next. So we called a family meeting and we put options on the table. And options were, do we go ahead and expand? Or do we uh, toy around with the idea of selling the company? Because you, know, you do want to sell a company when there's good potential, you get a good valuation, right? And we held that family meeting. And after that family meeting, I still remember uh, my dad and myself, you know, we sat down one-on-one. -on -one and I did ask my father, I said, uh, say that, why do we want to sell the company? See, we have such powerful technology and such a powerful product. 
Why do we need to sell the company? We can just go on and, and build and multiply and get the market. And actually, you know, what I was saying is just regurgitating what Mr. Kwan here was, uh, Mr. Kwan's intention, just regurgitating his intention. Because as an astute businessman, he knew the potential. And I guess uh, what I have done that day was to give my father uh, an assurance that, you know, we, want, we will do it. And that's when we said, we decided that we just go on and expand and take the market. All right. And so we went on to expand. We built Plan 4 in year 2008. And then we got the company listed in year 2008. You know. And getting the company listed, there's a whole story about it, but I don't want to be too long-winded. Where you know, Suisan was one of the main role in, in that uh, you know, story after we got listed because we had to go out and sell the company. It was very challenging for us because our profit margin is abnormal right, to many people. So, and sales, sales continue to grow. You know, we had customers who waited for gloves, their gloves, and they, they were so impatient because nitro glove sales was so good. There was a customer, I still remember, he said that if you don't give me my glove, I fly in tomorrow, you know, I take a stool, sit in front of your production line and make sure that every piece of glove is packed into my box. This was how good business was. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, nothing is smooth sailing all the way, right? Nothing is smooth sailing. We went into trouble in year 2009. We had a rough patch. A rough patch in the sense that, you know, we, we had a quality issue in year 2009. We measure our uh, yield by first-time quality acceptance rate. And normal, normally our first-time quality acceptance rate is about 99% on normal operations. But in year 2009, it suddenly plunged into 93%. You know, that's six to seven times, you know, lower than what we used to, to, to be able to achieve. So being a, a quality-driven uh, organization, you know, it was, like, it was like crisis. It was catastrophic for us. So all hands were on deck. My father was also in the plant. We were clocking in 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, you know. And I still remember at that time, I was still in the engineering department. My only responsibility was actually to build lines and commission lines. I, I didn't know what is glove production. And I had to be there in the plant, you know, together with my father and my cousins. You know, and I didn't know what was going on. It was a horrible experience for me because I felt so helpless when they were working so hard, but I couldn't contribute. Um, this went on for nine months. You know, and I still remember Chinese New Year. We only have half a day of break. And the first day of Chinese New Year, after lunch, we went back into the plant. And the troubleshooting started you know, all over again. You know, it was that kind of uh, struggle that we went through. But after nine months, we managed to find the solution and we solved the problem you know, when we got back to normal. So from there, I think what was very important is we did a post-mortem to find out and to learn what has happened. And we realized that, you know, we were too focused on just putting up new lines, churning out the capacity, and we've forgotten about our people. Our expansion has gotten ahead of our people. We did not make sure that our people were ready to take on the expansion, right? We did not have a structured HR uh, management system and a structured uh, uh, training system to make sure that you know, our people are prepared for the growth. So having learned that, you know, what we did is we you know, initiated a HR transformation program. So a HR transformation program, we started at a very low level because we didn't have any uh, HR systems. Uh, first thing we did was we implemented a performance management system. So performance management system, uh, at that time, comprises of two elements. One is targets, KPIs. So we started cascading KPIs, giving people targets, means your accountability, your roles and responsibility. And instead, we started to train the people to achieve their targets. But at the same time, we were also very mindful of the behavioral aspect of the people. 
Because KPI is just an end state, but the means to the end is also very important because we want people to have the right behaviour and this right behaviour will you know, form the culture of Hatalega in the future. So what we did was, we created these core values that we call SHIELD. So SHIELD is an acronym for S is Synergy, H is for Honesty, I, Innovativeness, E for Excellence, L for Learning, D for Dedication. Now how this came about is that you know, we knew we needed to measure our, all our workforce against the core values of Hatalega. But what is our core values? The only way to establish is we look upon our founder, Mr. K. H. Kwan. What has drove him to be successful? What he strongly advocates to see in his people. So we have identified you know, elements like dedication, training, you know, uh, innovations. Uh, uh, you know, I can't even remember, you know, there were six. So, but this, these six values were, were so difficult to remember, right? Um, so what we did was, we handpicked people who are good in English. We tell them now we have these six values called training, dedication, you know, integrity, and, and so on and so forth. We lock them in the room. So you think of an acronym. Work out an acronym, you know. If you don't think of an acronym, you cannot get out of this room. So they, they, it took them, you know, nine hours and they came up with this acronym, SHIELD, which is representative of the product that we produce. It's a barrier, it's a shield to uh, infection. And this is how today everyone in our organization is measured against these six core values, SHIELD values. Right? Then we built Plan 5, 2010, we became the world's largest nitrile glove manufacturer. And then again, that's where trouble started. Because in year 2010, our profit margin reached all-time high, 26% net. Uh, users switched. The momentum was ever so strong, switching from latex to nitrile gloves. Competitors lost market share. And then we started to notice that principles of our competitors started to sit in our corporate presentation in, our, in investors' conferences where we used to showcase our proprietary technology, videos of proprietary technology. That's when we realised that competition is coming. I smelled trouble. And I went back, you know what I did? I showed this to my team. I showed this to my team, I said, our enemies have arrived, are we ready? You know, so that is to instill urgency in our people that we cannot be complacent. Success cannot be the cause of our failure. We must know when competition is coming, right? And after instilling urgency, we went to the drawing board to draw up a grand plan, a strategy to receive competition, imminent competition. And this is what we arrive at, the four pillars of growth. The four pillars of growth, the main objective is to address our weaknesses. Our weaknesses, how do we overcome our weaknesses? And at the same time, we need to understand what, is our, what are our strengths and how do we maximise and capitalise on our strength to make us stronger. And collectively, we will keep winning. That is very important. For, for us when competition comes. Right? So that's why today we have still, still have a pillars of growth. Now it's five pillars. We have evolved to five pillars. And under the five pillars, we have strategic objectives that needed to be met. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have 76 ongoing corporate projects you know, where people work very hard to achieve the strategic objectives. And this is how structured we are. Every year, we spend close to three months in planning our strategy. Right. And then came uh, year 2012, we started operations of Plan 6, um, plan which marked the, uh, the last plant that we built in Bestari Jaya, in the last plot of land that is available in Bestari Jaya. So for future, we need to scout for new land, 
right, for our future expansion. And I was entrusted with this task. So I went all over. I went to Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, and then all over Malaysia. And then we decided that we wanted to expand within Malaysia. So our, the, the, the scouting of land, we, we zeroed in to, to Malaysia. And I went all over Malaysia to search for land. The first one I found was a 25 acres land. I showed it to uh, Mr. Kwan. Mr. Kwan showed me displeasure. I said, 25 acres smaller than what we have today. I said, okay, never mind. I went out and searched again. 55 acres, good size. But unfortunately, the location, location is not that suitable. Then one day, uh, our planning consultant called me. He said, Man Leong, I have this owner of this industrial park. Um, you know, he's interested, uh, there's the land, uh, there's an industrial park for sale. Are you interested? I said, why not? Come, let's meet. So we met. Uh, we had a meeting in our Sri Damansara office. It's our sales office. So they, we met the owner. He showed me the layout of the industrial park. One look at it, I say, I was so elated in the sense that it, it was nine months into the search. You know, I was so elated. I say, this is the right one. And I dashed out from the meeting room straight into my father's office. I say, Dad, we found the land. We found the land. And my father looked at it. He say, yeah, it's good. This is the one. And uh, so I told him, this is an industrial park. It's 400 acres. Right? Good, we take 100 acres. I said, what? 100 acres? From 55 acres to 100 acres, what are we going to build in, in 100 acres land? A township? See, he, you know, knowing my father, he, was set, he will not settle for anything lesser, right? So we had to take, in the end, we settled with 95 acres, uh, industrial land and a 17 acres water body because rubber glove uses a lot of water so we needed that as a water reserve so we bought the land and then now I'm entrusted to do a layout you know so I went and did the layout came out with 60 production lines very proud so that look good layout isn't it what is this there's all this empty space 60 production lines. You compare to Bestari Jaya in land utilization, it's not good. Go back and do again. They did scratch my head, did everything, came back. 72 number of production lines. Show it to him. Say, okay, this is yeah, more or less there. My father is a person who never say good, you know, he's a, <laughs> even though it's good. <laughs> so more or less there. See. But then my problem started. 72 production lines, 24 billion capacity in addition to the 12 billion of our existing capacity then. By the time we finish eight years later, three times the size of our current eight years. My God, how am I going to do this? And at that time, you know, my hair was still dark and black. <laughs> Very nice, you know, dark hair, you know. But today, you know, the reason why it has gone white. Um, so, then we knew that, oh, we trouble. We have to go back to the drawing board again. We have to revisit our strategy, the four pillars of growth. Because our biggest concern here is we don't want to grow into trouble. If we're going to grow three times in eight years, short, short span, how are we going to avoid going into systemic problems? How we ensure that we consistently produce high quality gloves, three times the capacity, and at two locations? Huge challenge, you know. So then, we, I, again, we did a SWOT analysis and we realised that what is really important for us is to make sure that we have the right people, the right systems and the right processes to manage an enlarged organisation and from two locations. So, and we redrew the four pillars of growth. Today it's become five pillars. And the... The, the mantra behind the five pillars of growth is we need to achieve global mobility. So we need to build a fundamentals that allow us to expand anywhere, build to any size that we can, and yet perform as well as we can, as we used to. That is the purpose of the five pillars of growth. 
So for in as far as you know, having operation from two locations is concerned, our focus is on knowledge management. We put a lot of emphasis on focus management today. We have invested about 20 million in our IT systems up to date. And one of the key focus is how do we manage knowledge so that people on both sides will learn the same thing, adopt the same best practices, and that's where we realize the economy of scale. And we use IT to do that. And we use IT to drive processes and systems as well, so that it's a standardized way of doing things, doing things good. And that's where we realize economy of scale. And at, at the, the other and the other thing that we really focus on, focus on is talent. So before we started NGC, there's a list of all the managers. And at that time, I know all the names of all the managers. Today, I, I apologize, uh, many of you, I don't know your names because we have about 200, how, how many managers we have? Uh, 120, right? At that time, we only had like, maybe uh, 30, 40 managers. I know all their names, so printed a name list, I handpicked the managers to be transferred to NGC. Because the other thing that we wanted to achieve with NGC, uh, the, 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 the plant that we, were gonna, we will build in uh, Sepang, the 95 acres land, is called NGC. So we wanted to refresh, use NGC as a platform to refresh the organization culture. So I handpicked the right people to be transferred. And then those positions, they are not filled. Right. I have a strict rule of thumb that no one from the glove industry, I want no one from the glove industry to fill in these vacancies. The reason is because the glove industry is a very young industry. In as far as in level of maturity is concerned, in terms of management practices, in terms of uh, technology, in terms of systems, relative to, you know, Industries that have been around for centuries, like automotive, you know, even semicon industry, they're very mature in areas, in such areas. Right? So that's why there's a lot to learn. You know, the glove industry has a lot to learn. And the only way is to learn from the others who is better than us. Although we are the world's largest, but we cannot be just too fixated on us being the world's largest, then therefore we are the best. No, we are not the best, but just that we are the world's largest for some good reasons. So we employed all the people, senior management, from outside the glove industry, and all handpicked by me. And in year 2005, NGC started the first line. This is a photograph, and why I want to show this photograph, it was very memorable to me because a week before this first production line at NGC started, the director of manufacturing, this guy here, he called me. He said, Manel, when are you coming to NGC? I said, why? I, I'm coming. You know, you're going to start the first line, right? I'm coming. He said, no, when, when are you going to come? I need you to press the button. I said, what? You know, it's something very new to me at that time because normally, first new plan, first line, I'll be there, you know. Um, I have tools on my pockets and then I'll touch the machine, I will commission the lines. That's how, that's how I work, right? But this time, this guy tells me that, no, it's not your job. You come here, you just press the button, take photo. I say, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm not complaining, I come. So I came, that day I went to the plant, in the afternoon, everything was set up. And he said, Manang, we are ready. First time I've experienced such you know, uh, it was a good feeling, you know. And I pressed the button, the line dipped, the first batch of gloves came out, and then we had to stop the line to carry out a debrief, debriefing on what to do uh, then the following day. And before I know it, you know, these guys, they started plucking out the formers from the production lines with the gloves still on, on the formers. And they started handing me these formers, hey, hey, hey my Leon, please sign on these formers. So they asked me to autograph on these this formers, you see, as a memento for, for them, you know. And they, all of them still kept it. And most of these people, all the happy faces, they're still with us until today. So what it says, this photograph tells us that our formula and our strategy worked. It worked. 
You know, although we have not experienced it uh, before, we have not done it before, but it worked. And it's uh, quite uh, an inspiration even to ourselves, people who set up this strategy that we did not know whether it worked or not, but it worked. So today, what we have achieved in NGC, I show you this. When we plan NGC, announce NGC, we had targets that we wanted to achieve. So one of them is, it was a 2.2 billion budget uh, that we set aside. Now we have invested 1.5 billion in NGC. 72 production lines, 41 production lines has just uh, come, is, is running now. Over the last two years, you know, we more than doubled the size of the organization and we perform much better than before. 2.6, we measure productivity by uh, workers' headcount per million pieces. So our target was for NGC 2.6, and we have achieved that target. And we expect this to continue to trend down further, our productivity to continue to improve. Uh, OEE, OEE is overall equipment efficiency. We had a target of only 88% OEE, but today NGC is achieving 92%. Anyone in, the glove, anyone in the manufacturing sector, they know that global gold standard is 85%. And I like to say this, I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant. I think uh, we, in, in Malaysia, you have a company that I think you can be proud of you know, for this kind of numbers. Um, we managed to increase a customer base by two times. We're still the largest glove a nitrile glove manufacturer in the world. And our profit margin is still above the industry's average. There was a period in year 2015 where the investment community doubted us because there were costs that were running ahead because NGC is a big project. There were costs running ahead of NGC's operations. Profit margin dipped and people were saying Hata Lega is losing its leadership position. But we kept quiet. You know, we kept our, put, kept our heads down, we worked very hard, we knew what was coming. And now, you know, our leadership is uh, further cemented. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a video of NGC. Each plant will have 12 lines, factory 1, factory 2, factory 3, fully operational, all 12 lines. Factory 4, we have 5 lines now running. This is a sort of a dated uh, aerial video. Actually, plant 5, factory 5, we have started construction already. So we are doing the foundation work. Factory 6 will most probably start next year. Workers' quarters, you know, we have a mini market in the workers' quarters. Uh, here, we are constructing the R&D Centre and the Learning Centre. Right. So that's why we call it the Next Generation Integrated Glove Manufacturing Complex. It's all facilities integrated in one campus alone. So that is uh, the end of uh, my story of growth and transformation. There were successes, there were you know, uh, problems we had, we learned from it. Uh, sorry, I, I still have a few more words. Uh, right. uh, are we, are we, we, we still have time, right? Yeah. So uh, I'd like to talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, philosophies, right? Uh, philosophies that I've learned a lot from my father, philosophies that I have acquired over the period of you know, high growth and over a period of all the hard work that we put in. Um, my father is a perfectionist. Uh, my father strong, always advocated that we must know everything. So when I joined the company, you know, I was put into the raw material preparation area. And I still remember this guy bullied me. He asked me to clean the tank. 
you know, it's a confined tank. You know, I had to go in with all the PPE. You know, and he told me that it's it's a rule in Hatalega where every new engineer who joined has to clean the tank. Actually, it's nonsense. He lied to me. <laughs> For what reason, I don't know. Because maybe, you know, being a uh, uh, the son of the founder, you you either you. You go, you get through with no problems, or you get it very hard. You get it very hard because you know it's there's no middle. You know. So, uh, you know, I, I I had to learn everything from ground up, and uh, which made me realize that for success, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut to success. It's all about hard work, right? And uh, the other thing that my father also advocates is. Of course, it's integrity and quality. And uh, we need to know our weaknesses. See, a lot of times it's when people are successful, ego takes over. You cannot accept criticism. Once you stop accepting criticism, you will not know your own weakness. Once you don't know your own weakness, you will not know what to do to overcome your weaknesses. But when you know your weaknesses, to overcome your weaknesses, you need to work towards overcoming the problems. That's when you need to build stamina. Right? And you need to have the grit to solve the problem and solve it and not give up until the problem is solved. So what is grit? Grit is perseverance and passion. I also learned that passion can be developed because I didn't like glove manufacturing. But I now, I love glove manufacturing. I have a passion. Passion can be developed. But you need to persevere. And how you build stamina to persevere is you need to have routines. Routines in life is, I think, is very important. Routines that will keep you in a good state of mental health. Routines that will keep you in a good state of physical health is very important. Your exercise routines. Your routines... Uh, going out with friends to laugh off your stress is important. I have a group of friends here who has been with me since seven years old and they keep me grounded. I have friends with me since uni. They keep me grounded. Um, and routines, but we have to be careful. Do not build routines that will keep you in your comfort zone. Your routines must keep kicking you out from your comfort zone. That's very important. And what do I mean by that? Like thinking routines. Every day, you go to the toilet, you take a shower, and you do your own moments in the toilet, right? But these are things, activities that you do, your brain doesn't need to think. So keep your mind, your brain occupied. Think about it. Think about what you have done yesterday. Think about what you're going to do today. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this, but there are some students here, I just want to give them some, some two cents, my two cents. Um, think of what you want to do the following day. Think of whether you have, you're achieving your targets, whether you're in line in achieving your targets. If you're not, you better do something different. Right? That is a thinking routine that keeps you out of the comfort zone. And life is all about Balancing act. When your life is balanced, what does it mean? It means that you may have achieved all your targets. That's why you find that your life is balanced. Then you ask yourself this question, you know, again, thinking routine. Whether I want to set new targets. When you set new targets, you want to work towards your new targets, your life will become imbalanced. Are you ready to accept that imbalance and the sacrifices? So if you are ready, you set those targets. You change what you do because these are new targets and you get yourself in an imbalanced situation. And then hopefully one day you achieve the targets. Then you'll find yourself balanced again. Then do you want to go into imbalance? So this is by itself a routine. And this is what I have personally experienced in the quest of the growth of Hatalega. Right. And the other aspect that uh, we hold very strongly philosophy is in business is about 
and reaching people's lives. People within the organization, people that surround us. If you are able to enrich the people's life, this is where your company will strive well, your company will excel. For example, in Hatulega, uh, we have ESOS share option scheme. The first share option scheme, you know, in total, I think the, we calculate, did a calculation. The gain is 51 million uh, total gain, share options. And these share options are extended from senior management right down to executive level. And the first share option scheme, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Kwans did not participate. There were no options for the Kwans. We gave it just to the people. Now we, are, we have entered into the second share option scheme. Um, now the Kwans are in. <laughs> uh, the second share option scheme uh, started in year 2010. So people who are with us since year 2010, you know, guess what? The share uh, allocated to them is at a price of four ringgit and twenty-five cents fixed for five years. Today, the share price is seven ringgit seventy cents. And and in addition, the option is extended all the way to clerical staff now, technicians, supervisors. They all have it because there's no purpose where. We pocket all the money. Well, people who contributed and worked for us did not experience the enrichment process. Um, we also do a lot of community work surrounding our factories. We adopt schools. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, supply medical supplies to uh, homes of uh, women and men with HIV and AIDS, children as well. Uh, all these are done straight out from uh, you know, our pockets, the, the, the company, because we don't have a foundation. And we hardly publish, publicize all these activities because we believe that you know, a true sense of giving back to the community, you have to give back to your surrounding community first. You know, charity starts from home. You know, we hold true to this. And because we are in the outskirt, and most of the time, you will find that uh, when organizations give back to community, they will choose charitable organizations in urban areas. Why? It's a conduit to publicity. So what is left is that most of the charitable organizations in the outskirts are neglected. And that's why we want to do where we are. You know. So... Sorry, this, this is my, uh, some of our fifth philosophies. Okay, I think uh, we should take questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kwan, for the very informative and insightful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting the Q&A shortly. May I invite Mr. Shamugan to join Mr. Kwan Man Leong for the Q&A session. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to Man Leong here? <laughs> I think he spoke for almost 45 minutes, you know. Okay, now is a Q&A session as usual. Uh, please keep your questions short. And, and uh, yeah, before I can even open the floor, you already got hands up already. <laughs> yeah, just give me a minute. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, try to ask questions, uh, proposals, or anything else. You know, you can take it offsite <laughs> somewhere else. Okay, yeah, and I've got my colleagues around here. Maybe you can just state your name and where you're from, so that it's easier for us to identify uh, what's your context. And then, uh, yeah, yes, young man. Hi, morning. I'm Fairis. Um, I just like to know. I'm sure going through this big leap of, I mean, growth. Where, where, where are you from, Fairis? I'm from uh, Meditech, a small glove manufacturing company. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so going through this um, huge growth. I mean, yeah, no I'm comments, sure. No comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sorry. sure you've um, 
gone through stages whereby you you feel like giving up, or I, mean, I don't know, perhaps going through uh, feel of feeling of like giving up, or I mean um, to to things think through. So how do you actually psych yourself to really I mean go on on a day to day basis? I mean going through all the challenges and whatnot. Um, I I guess the the giving up is never in my character. You know the I you know. When I was young, I, I, I was a very quiet uh, boy, um, and I never did well in uh, my my studies. Uh, and my parents always bash me on that, you know. They, and they always have praises for uh, my other siblings and my cousins do well as well in their studies. You know, I'm I was the bad apple in the family. So uh, I'm. I'm so used to all these uh, awkward situations, right? And therefore, I was very quiet uh, when I was a boy. Uh, but deep down inside me, you know, I, I never give up. You know, I, I know my shortcomings. Uh, I'm not a talented person. Uh, so I know my shortcomings, and therefore, I know I need to work hard. So that has been built in, in me, I guess, in, in, in a certain way. So I have never thought of giving up, never, uh, in, in, in the course of you know, this growth. Perhaps there were times where you know, there, there were emotion, emotions do set in. I think uh, one of it is, uh, I'll be, you know, I, I already committed to you that this is no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to hold back on, on today, right? Because it's a family business. A family business, uh, what is difficult is that, uh, you know, there, there is uh, a family element in the business. So you, there's no such thing as you can, you know, separate the two. So, and we need to manage uh, the family part of the, the, the business. And that's where the, the, the most challenging thing is in, in, in Hatalega. So there were times that, you know, emotions do set in because of this. Uh, but, you know, we, we just don't, there's, there's no such thing as giving up. We just try. Uh, I think the, the, the other thing that is important is we need to know our own natural uh, frequency. Our body, everyone has a natural rhythm in their body. So you, when you do things uh, against your natural rhythm, right, you find that you will not run the, the, the marathon. You know, it's just a, a, probably a 50 meter or 100 meter dash. If, you're, if you work against your natural rhythm of your body, you want to work very fast, faster than what your body can, can take, right? You will wear off very quickly and, and you will lose the battle. You know, in, 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 organ, in, in transforming organizations, in growing a business, it's all about stamina. So you need to have the stamina and you need to be in, in sync with your natural frequency of your, your body. That's, that's very important. So as far as the, the family part of the business is concerned, I think the, there was a period where you know, I was given this seat and it was difficult you know, at that time. But now it's all good. You know. uh, my, my cousins are here. You know. My brother is working very hard in Germany. You know, it's trying to sell gloves. Uh, I think they have a lot of respect for me. Uh, that, that struggle is, 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 is the history. Sorry, Manyong. I just would like to ask a question. You mean the difficulty in running this business because of the family running it together with you? You know, what what was the biggest challenge that you? The, the biggest challenge here is because among the people, uh, the second generation in the business, I'm the youngest. So um, there is a family hierarchy, and that family hierarchy does not, you know, coincide with the organization hierarchy. So if you reverse it, say I'm the, el the elders, right? So you guys listen. Shut up and listen, right? No, you, you can't do that. Even if you are the elders, you can't do that in a family business. So it, it, you do need to do a lot of convincing. Talk to them, a lot of convincing. We do argue, but we argue constructively. And that is what is important. When arguments become non-constructive, Say, hang on, no, you should stop this. Let's come back and talk about it again. 
But when we talk, there's no such thing as asserting authorities within the family. It's all about convincing. And the other part that is challenging is because like, I, have, I have a few people here. I have a few general managers and a few senior managers in this room who is here now listening to us. And these people, day in, day out, they will worry, you know. Uh, this Kwan's there, and what's in it for me in the future? But it's very clear to the people that, you know, we go by merits. The Kwan's will not be a hindrance to anyone's, anyone's progress in the organisation. You know, and I think that today we're done quite well in that, in that sense because uh, I still remember one day, um, one of my general manager, he just he, he told me, "Say, Man Leong, I I'm very grateful uh, that you've given me the chance." He said, "I owe you, you know, I owe you, I owe it to you, you know." And from there, you know, I realized that, you know, we have successfully created a home, not only for the Kwan family, but a home for our people as well, that our people appreciate to be uh, in Hatalega. Yes, uh, the gentleman there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Tay. I'm from Tunku Abdul Rahman University College. Okay. The student at the back, I brought in by me. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are doing a project. Uh, the subject I'm teaching is business strategy in practice. So I was selecting company. They come to Power Talk to present their story. And we are doing it as a project. So, right, so, so if you are interested in my students, then I will uh, speak to your uh, HR directors. <laughs> that was a good indirect pitch. <laughs> okay, your question yes. is, sir. My question is, uh, Malaysia is the, uh, what they call, having a very uh, high competitive advantage among nations in rubber globe, in globe production uh, industry. Uh, what are the elements contributing to this national success? That is number one. We are talking about a whole industry rather than just Hatha Lager, right? And the other one, you as one of the main player in the industry, what are your competitive advantage against the others? These are my two questions. Okay. Uh you know, I, I'm certainly interested in, in your students. Uh, personally, I have a, f a, a, a huge passion to give back to the, to, to the education, right? If you want some of my time, you know, I can try to provide. Uh, now, the first question is, what is the competitive advantage of Malaysia glove industry, right? Uh, I count it to two things. One is the captains of the industry, the people like my father, people like all the Tan Sri's, they, they have carved out an industry that is so successful, they worked hard. They wrestled the control from the multinationals. Those days when the multinationals were the big ones. We wrestled it from the multinationals. We showed the multinational how glove is supposed to be made at efficiently, at a low cost, by putting in the hard work. So that is no single glove company out there that is successful is not owner-operated. So that's the commitment, the conviction of the owners. The second competitive advantage is because of the growth and evolution of the glove industry, Malaysia has a complete ecosystem that supports, supports the glove industry. You name it, chemical, in, chemical uh, producers, nitrile makers. We have in Jason Davis, the world's largest uh, nitrile material uh, uh, producer, Sintoma. They, they started to invest in Malaysia, um, yeah, they, in the nitrile plant, you know, coincide with the uh, nitrile sales uh, growth. Uh, research agencies, engineering companies, all these, uh, uh, you know, people that support the glove industry. It's a complete ecosystem, all located within Malaysia. And that's the competitive advantage that none, no other nations have. And this is what makes Malaysia great as a glove manufacturing uh, you know, nation. Right. The second question is uh, Hatalega. Hatalega, uh, I mentioned in my 
uh, presentation just now, the DNA of Hatalega is it started from my father is we create technology. We have passion for technology. We die for technology. And rubber glove, it's a very um, young industry. There's no, no uh, uh, ready-made, off-the-shelf technological solutions out there, like the automotive industry. I take give you give one very good example. Uh, the semicon industry, which is very mature, they have digital imaging, right? Of all the chips that they produce, very high volume, they take photographs, and the photographs will be analyzed by computers, supercomputers, to find the defects of the chips that they make. And that's that's what makes our computers so stable today, right? In terms of performance. But if you want to have ask but in this digital imaging solution, you go out to any uh, exhibition, you can find, oh, I, this is for these chips, this is for that, uh, you know, PCB mounting, you know, all ready-made solutions out there. But if you ask them, hey, I want some for gloves, what is that? There's no ready-made technology out there. And therefore, Hatalega is in its, this space where Innovation is our DNA. Technology is our strength. And we continue to build new technology, innovate with new technology. And that's why our efficiency, if you look at it, by measure of profit margin, we have doubled the industry's average. Because of our technology, because of efficiency. We sell our gloves into the same market as our competitors. You know, we cannot be selling at double the price to get the double the profit. No, we cannot. So it's our technology, that's our strength. Our innovation, that's our strength. And on top of that, what we have built today with NGC is another new set of DNA. It's a strive to excellence. I think this DNA is slowly it's culminating. And it's build, we are building this DNA now. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um. Hi, Mr. Kwan. Thank you so much for your time um, and also sharing all this uh, valuable info information and in insights. Yeah. Your, your name, please. My name is Rahima. I'm uh, from. I'm a trade consultant from Orissa International. My first question is actually: you talked about um, looking looking in for the location for the manufacturing plant in uh, back in 2012 or 2013. You were looking outside of Malaysia. Uh, so why was the, why was Malaysia was chosen instead of other locations in uh, South Asia? That was the first. And the second one is a bit off uh, from the uh, business uh, side. What, was it, what, what is your routine, your success routine, day-to-day -day basis? We would like to know that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, why Malaysia was chosen, two reasons. One is uh, we are Malaysians. We, Malaysia is a country that we know best. So in terms of risk averse, right, Malaysia is the safest bet. Rather than we go abroad and it's a devil that we do not know. Right? Um, the other reason is because we were not ready to have an operation abroad. Uh, if you look at the, our growth story, right, we, there were so many things that we had to put in place. Um, systems, processes, the right talents. Before we started, uh, at the time where we decided we need to expand outside of Pestari Jaya, we didn't have the right systems, we didn't right, have the right processes, we didn't have the right people to have a, an operations that is abroad. Right? So it's like, if you go do, do that, it's like putting the cart in front of the horse. So we realized that we shouldn't do that. That's the approach of Hatalega today. Everything that we do, we need to plan. We need to make sure that we are capable. Our capabilities is there. Today, if you ask me whether we have the capabilities to go anywhere in the world to build a plant, yes, we do. The only constraint today is we don't have enough talents. But we have all the systems, processes, best practices. I have... Uh, I have an operation excellence department comprising of 30 over engineers. They all directly report to me. They look at, at, at our 
uh, operations day in, day out to make sure that best practices are implemented. You know, and these are all blueprint that we have documented. It's all stored in our central servers. And this blueprint, we can take it to anywhere in the world and just build a plant. It will just operate as is, is efficient. The only thing that is lacking now is the people that we have. You know, we are very thin because of our high growth. So that was the reason the, why we did not expand overseas, because we're not ready. And that's the also the reason why we chose Malaysia. My, my personal routine, actually, I'm a very boring person, you know. I, I have my friends there, you know, always they ask me, you know, come out, you know, come out and, you know, let's have dinner, let's have drinks. Uh, I have my, my, my exercise routines, um, you know, my badminton days, my, my golfing days, you know, and I try not to miss uh, those uh, uh, exercise days. When I miss them, I get very grumpy and my wife will, will, will know it. You know. Uh, and every day, uh, you know, when I wake up, you know, the they, first thing I do is I turn on my handphone. And in my handphone, there is this screen that tells me what is happening in my factory. So I, I look at the screen, uh, uh, you know, the first thing in the morning. And then after that, I, I, I go and do my usual toilet stuff. You know, that, what I told you is true, you know. Uh, shower, you know, the, the on moments. And that's where I start thinking. That's where I start thinking. And that 10 to 15 minutes of thinking process where, you know, when you're in the toilet, no one is, no one is supposed to, to, to intrude, intrude your time in the toilet, right? <laughs> that's when you think, that's when it's the quietest moment. That's where thoughts are most, most effective and most constructive. And most of the time, ideas actually came from those days, those times. You know. So this is a routine that I enjoy a lot, you know, the thinking routine. Uh, you know, that, that basically is, is my, my, my routine. Okay. Uh, before the question, you know, this, uh, just, just a minute, sir, one minute. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. You know, you have been showing this uh, double-digit growth, very high double-digit growth, you know. Uh, it's been going on for, what, eight to ten years now? Twelve years now. Uh, this kind of growth figures are only in young industries, uh, very volatile. I mean, but, uh, do you think that this kind of growth is going to go on, and what makes you think this kind of growth will keep on going on? My father will... <laughs> answer this question very well. You know, they <coughs> the glove industry will continue to grow. We don't see a limit, honestly. The reason is because per capita consumption in Asia is only seven pieces on the average per person per year. If you look towards the western part of the world, on the average they use 200 pieces of gloves Per person per year, where is the most populous region of the world? Is Asia, right? So, take for example, combine, combining China and India, you know, it's close to three billion in population, right? If you multiply that with, I just say, if these two nations grow to a per capita of fifty pieces on the average, it's so many times bigger than the current global market size of gloves. So gloves will continue to grow, the demand will continue to grow. Right? And the question is, what do the glove companies need to do? What does Hatalega needs to do to keep riding on this bandwagon? You know, that's a whole new chapter, you know, a big chapter, you know. Otherwise, you can't leave this room. We we'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, my name is P. K. Chan from the Plastic and Rubber Institute Malaysia, or PRIM, uh, which is an NGO uh, professional body uh, which conduct training and education courses for the rubber industry. Uh, pleased to hear that, uh, Mr. Kwan, you mentioned about your 2010, 2010 when you have a quality issue whereby uh, you have uh, embarked on this uh, HR. Uh, transformation program. Yeah, you have mentioned about innovations, you have mentioned about your own R&D centers. Of course, we are very pleased that uh, we have your employees from Hatalega joining some of the courses. 
Uh, my question is that uh, you earlier mentioned that uh, right now uh, there's about 60% uh, of the world market demand for nitrile gloves, okay, uh, versus natural rubber gloves. As you know that Malaysia, uh, no doubt we have lost the top producer of natural rubber uh, in the world about 25 years ago, but we remain the top four, five maybe, or six major uh, producer of natural rubber latex, right? And we have been talking about global warming, yeah? And uh, you know that, uh, we know that very well, natural rubber is a uh, environmental friendly, non-renewable -renew resource, renewable resources par excellence, you know? So what is your forecast, you know, the trend of nitrile gloves versus natural rubber gloves? And the last question is, why nitrile gloves must be blue in colour? <laughs> I answer the, the easier one. It doesn't need to be blue. It can be green. <laughs> it can be pink. Uh, it's just that when we came out with our nitrile glove, uh, we first show it to our, one of our customers. Maybe his favourite colour is blue. So he asked us to make it blue. So that's when the blue colour started. But... Uh, you know, honestly, you know, natural rubber is uh, white or off-white, right? So you need to differentiate the two. So you need, it cannot be, uh, a, preferably not white. There is white nitrile glove as well. And why you need to differentiate the two? Because nitrile has no protein uh, content, therefore there's no protein allergy risk. So which brings me to answer your second question. That's the strength of nitrile gloves. So, and it's as, as far as, uh, I know where you're coming from, uh, global warming, you know, sustainability. Um, but if you look at it from a uh, view, uh, uh, re using, net, using resources, resource utilization in a holistic manner, in glove production, right? Raw material is just part of it, right? Your source of raw material is just one part of the whole glove manufacturing process. So retro rubber is, comes from nit rubber tree. You can say it's renewable, it's environment friendly, as opposed to nitrile, that is a petrochemical based product that is not unenvironment friendly. But if you look at the sum of all parts, that's not true because nitrile glove is a lot lighter in weight compared to natural rubber gloves. Today, nitrile gloves can be as light as uh, 2.7 gram. Compared to natural rubber glove, the weight is 5 grams and above. And therefore, the uh, 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 resources that are required to, to go into production of nitrile glove is a lot lesser than uh, natural rubber gloves. For example, energy usage. You know, uh, for example, uh, logistics costs. You know, all this factor in together, you know, you would say that these are the advantages of nitrile over natural rubber. And on top of that, because there is a purpose, there is a purpose for nitrile gloves, there's a need for nitrile gloves. You can't run away from that because there's no protein allergy. Right? So if the world needs it, how do we make it more environment friendly? I think that's, that's the question. If the world doesn't need it, there's a replacement then. Maybe we should relook at, you know, the, the, the nitrile glove product, but the world needs it, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Very good afternoon, uh, Mr. Kwan. Uh, I'm Agnes Yao. I run a business management consultancy firm for the aerospace industry for 14 years. Thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. Uh, my question is, business is cyclical. When we are doing well, all is well and good. What advice would you give an SME like ours without the resources of a PLC when our business is down, is there still hope? Okay. I think one of the, uh, one of my, my weakness is that I, I, you know, I work for a family business, right? Uh, you know, we, we have not, and we, I work for a business that is in a sector where you know, the market is not a concern. You know, Rubber glove is like a recession-proof uh, uh, industry. You know. So we have never experienced where we need to be concerned about market uh, growth, market demand. Uh, but uh, your, your question of 
Uh, sorry, what's your question again? No, what what to do? What to do when the the when, when the, the business, business is down for down a small company like ours company, uh, without the resources yeah. of a PLC? Yeah, basically without the financial resources. Yeah, I I cannot. Oh, it's uh, not relevant to you. No, no, no. The the it's it's. I think uh, I can draw. Because we have not experienced it before, right? Uh, I can draw some of the teaching uh, that I learned from my, my father. My father used to operate uh, SMEs, SMIs. Uh, before Hatzelega, he used to run a, uh, a, a weaving company, Woven Labels, uh, in the early 80s. And uh, the textile industry has slowly moved into China. China has become so so competitive. Uh, although the company that he used to operate is Timo Viving, it's it's very successful. We are always the best in whatever we do, whatever business we do. But we cannot fight external factors like that when the industry started to move to China. So the my father taught me this is that they must when we do things or we start a business. There must be an exit plan. There must always be an exit plan. So when I think I guess it's up to the people in the uh, in the business to decide whether you know is whether it's time to trigger the exit plan, or there are still opportunities for you to to tap into, right? And the other thing that I can relate is when things are good. When things are good, you better be very concerned. Because I, I can tell you uh, our performance is good now, but my stress level is very high because when you things are good, uh, you know you don't want to screw up. When things are good, you may be blinded because things are so good. So you have to look beyond uh, what is good and wear a th different thinking hat and wear a, uh, the hat of a pessimist. That's, that's very important. Then when you wear a hat of a pessimist, then you start thinking and thinking and thinking. You think further down the road. And that's where you will be able to connect the dots and you will have a vision of the future. It's like you will have what you have created, a crystal ball for yourself of the future. Your crystal ball might not be the right telling you the right thing, but at least you have gone through that thinking process and you react to it. At least you, you, are, you are taking action, but you are not in action. You know, that's what's, what's important, I think. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh. Hi, Mr. Kwan. Uh, my name is Poa. Mr. Kwan, in the lab... Yeah, in you're the from which industry? Uh, I'm a lawyer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kwan, in the latter part of your talk, uh, you spoke about your philosophy on success, accepting criticism, um, cultivating passion, having greed, establishing routines. Uh, are these philosophies, uh, these thinking processes imparted uh, by your father? Uh, are, are these part of the Kwan family values or uh, passed on by father to son, ingrained amongst your family members? Uh, second question, besides your father who obviously has played a big role in your life, in, in your career. Who else, if I may ask, are your mentors, if there are, other than your father? Who else do you admire? Who do you strive to emulate? Uh, those things that I talk about, great passion, uh, routines, uh, of course, um, a lot of them I learned from my father. You know, it's it's especially great pers perseverance. Uh, passion is something that uh, I find that my own passion is always an outcome of a sense of responsibility. If I'm put in a position where I'm responsible for this, I better be passionate about it. Otherwise, forget it, don't do it, right? So day in, day out, you know, I will try to develop the passion for it. Now I am very passionate about the, the, glove the, the glove industry, right? So all the other part that I've told you about the routines, the thinking process is uh, where I picked all this from, it's not from books, 
I, I don't like to read. Uh, I'm allergic to books, honestly. Uh, by the 20th page, I will fall asleep. Uh, I admire my son because he can sit down and just read the whole book, right? Uh, of course, I read, I read the stars. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do read the stars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I read is journals, uh, news. I read news twice a, twice a day, you know, actually three times a day. So in the morning, I wake up, I read the news. In the afternoon and at night before I go to bed, I read the news. Uh, but one thing I really do, uh, do a lot is I talk to people a lot. So when I go out, uh, I'm very selective of spending my time uh, meeting who. Right? Of course, other than my friends, you know, we go out and you do silly things, right? But the people that I go, events, functions, right? I, don't, I choose very wisely. I see that, oh, this is some people there I can talk to, I can learn from. I go, I talk to them. And when they tell me things, a lot of times because I'm a slow learner, so they will tell me things, but I have an instinct of picking up messages from people that I might not understand at that, at that point in time, but I will put it in here. Then the computer starts running, you know, and I think and think and think, what he had just told me. And some, sometimes, you know, the, it just connects. I still remember, um, you know, I'm an engineer uh, uh, by training, right? So I went to do MBA. Engineers are all very square headed and square headed one, you know. I went to do MBA and then you have all these corporate guys, you know, who are doing all this presentation, you know, their hands are like me now. <laughs> and, and I was like, I strength into the corner and say, Oh shit, these people are so articulated, right? But I met people there. I met this person, a senior manager in Sim Dhabi, now he's in Singapore, a CFO in Singapore. So he knew my family background, he knew what comes in the future for me. And he told me three things, you know, say, Man Leong, you need to be careful. Say, in this position that you're going to inherit, you need to be, your health is very important, your family is important, and your HR. And until today, I still remember very clearly this, these things. You know, this is the emphasis. Right, so, you know, a lot of this is talking to people, connect the dots, put it together, what is valuable, and you practice it. Why I have an exercise routine, you know, I, I also be honest with you, I learned it from Tan Sri Lim Bi Chai. <laughs> yeah. So, so why we need to have this exercise? You need, you need to have the exercise, you need to be healthy, fit, to run an organization. Right. Do you have another question? Uh, did I answer all your questions? Who, who else? Oh, uh, I, I actually, apart from my dad, uh, I have not found one yet. I have not found another one. Yeah, not found. Okay, um, I just got the cue. <laughs> we are down to the last two questions. Uh, okay, there's one gentleman here, and then we'll come back to you. Can we? Yes. Me yeah, first. go ahead. Right. Yeah. Okay, my name is Mr. Go. I'm from Capital Dynamics Asset Management. I'm an equity analyst. So the company has uh, above average uh, net margin, which is around 20 cents, higher than the industry average of 10 cents. So what drives the higher margin? Is it the lower cost of nitrile? And is it sustainable into the future? It's not the lower cost of nitrile. Uh, our peers, they do manufacture nitrile glove as well. It's collectively how we do things. Uh, our technology, our efficiency, uh, technology, they're proprietary to us. And how we do things, uh, we strive for excellence in, 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 in two areas. Manufacturing excellence, supply chain excellence. How we plan from uh, the ordering of materials to delivery to our customers. We have a very uh, integrated uh, supply chain and value chain system. We train our people very well in these aspects. This is something that we have picked up from the uh, other sectors other than the, the glove uh, industry. Manufacturing excellence, we have a very strong lean manufacturing program in our organization. Uh, if you go to NGC, it's like a Japanese factory. It's clean, it's organized. We have uh, Kaizen programs, people, 
from the floor will contribute. They want to contribute. They want to do well for the organization. They, we have ideas, hundreds of ideas. You know, and all these ideas come to me, we endorse it, and we scale up. You know, this is some examples, you know, but at the end of the day, it's some of all parts on how we operate our business. But the key competitive advantage is our technology. How sustainable? Uh, I, I ask a question every day. Honestly, you know, because no one knows what the future beholds, right? So we just need to always put our best foot forward and do what is required. You know, but we have a DNA that I think uh, is quite unique for, for Hatale guy. Okay, the, the last question, yes. Sir. Um, Mr. Kwan, my name is uh, Wong. I'm a retiree. Uh, after listening to your presentation, I think your company is a good counter to invest. Recently, I heard a lot about this, uh, what you call manufacturing 4.0. Can you tell us whether you are going to implement this in your company and how you are going to implement I have here today uh, the, my IT uh, general manager. He's the head of IT. Uh, Liang, can you just stand up and show, show your face? Yeah. Uh, he's one of my... Uh, key uh, member in my team. Uh, you know, you, you have. Are we connect, uh, Mandy? Are we connected to the Wi-Fi? There's no Wi-Fi here. Okay, I show you this. Uh, Wh where's my Where's my handphone, Mandy? Can you give me my handphone, please? Sorry, sorry. I know we we we. No problem. Sorry, it's okay. We crossed yeah. the, the time, yeah. twelve o'clock. No, no, it's okay. You I wanted to show you some of the, the IoT technology that we have. We already have in our organization. Because industry 4.0 is all about IoT, right? I don't know whether my, my people will, will scold me for showing this because uh, they know that I'm participating in this talk. Some of them tell me, don't show them so many things <laughs> because our competitors will know. But I promise you, we will not hold back because I, I, I want you all to benefit, right? So I just press my handphone. So this is over internet. This is the status of my factory in NGC. So it's a quality screen, right? So green is good, good quality. So I know the quality of our, uh, the, 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 the operations of uh, my factory on a real-time basis. These are just small little pockets of uh, IoT technology that we apply. But Industry 4.0 is all about connecting not only your factory floor, but connecting your factory operations with your business processes, your supply chain management, and your sales order processing, all connected into a central brain. Right? And this central brain is your computer will tell you and give you recommendation of what to do next. That is I, uh, Industry 4.0. Now, a lot of the uh, uh, companies in Malaysia is, is Industry 4.0, there's a lot of hype in Malaysia. I have never attended any conferences on Industry 4.0 except for one that I've been to recently, that was last month. It's because, uh, personally, I don't believe in attending conferences because what they tell you is all very general knowledge and information. So. In the, in, in the last 18 months, I've been talking to a lot of people, uh, subject matter experts. So after I have, uh, we have connected the dots, we have mapped out our Industry 4.0 journey, then I went to attend the, the, the conference. I, and I do realize that the, the pitfalls, the risks of Malaysian companies, if they want to embark on Industry 4.0 is they don't know the, that Industry 4.0 is not a, 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 tech, a discrete technology where I want it, there you go, you have it, no. Industry 4.0 is a journey, it's a process. So we need to know where is your starting point of the journey. 
And where's the starting point of the journey is, where are you now as an organization in as far as the journey of Industry 4.0 is concerned? Right? So a lot of companies, uh, the basic fundamentals are not in place for the Industry 4.0, including Hatalega. There are some areas of processes where we are not there yet, we're still very low level in terms of IT technology. So to answer your question, we are going into Industry 4.0. In fact, there is a person in this room that worked with us, you know, a vendor, you know, to take us there. So what I'm saying is that we have already mapped out a whole journey, you know, from A to Z of how to get to Industry 4.0. We are very clear of what we want to do. I'm personally very clear of which technology we should Im invest in, in as far as the floor, uh, manufacturing floor, the production lines, the business systems, the, the people, the expertise, the talent required for the Industry 4.0. We have a very clear roadmap, and now we are executing that roadmap. And to tell you, I think the journey will take us three to four years where at, uh, at, at, at four years' time, you will be able to see not only the quality screen on my handphone, but everything on my handphone. Right? And this is part of the quest towards uh, global mobility for, for Hatalega. All this will converge to become, you know, to create global mobility for us. So, yes, we are going into Industry 4.0. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, can you Thank you, Mr. Kwan, for taking our questions. I would now like to invite Mr. Shamugan to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Kwan Manlyong for being our speaker today. Thank you very much. 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 Th